So up to now, we've talked a lot about architects and designers and landscape architects and social theorists and sociologists. But if you've noticed, I haven't really used the word planner. And that's because up until the early 20th century, there was no such thing as a, quote, urban planner. There was no discipline called city planning. It was not taught at universities. And that began to change. All these disciplines came together around planning as people in different disciplines and practices realized that a coherent school of cities was necessary. Up until the early 20th century, city planning, or what we now today consider city planning, had not been any official or professional discipline. There had been no city department of planning, and it had not, as I said, been an academic field of study. Bits and pieces of planning had belonged to other disciplines like architecture, design, sociology, politics, and other places. So the bringing together of various ideas, practices, theories, and philosophies of the city into planning was one of the innovations of the early 20th century. From the first official planning bodies in cities like New York and London, to the birth of the first official comprehensive plans and general plans, planners now had new power and great responsibility to remake cities and urban life. This is showing the Daniel Burnham plan for San Francisco. And unlike Chicago, this was never realized in full. And some of you might have a guess why that is by looking at the date here, which is 1905. Well, in 1906, of course, the great San Francisco earthquake and fire would destroy most of the city. And the city then had to be rebuilt very quickly, and so parts of this plan were lost. However, parts of Daniel Burnham's plan for San Francisco were realized, especially in the outer areas, places like St. Francis Wood. But you can see that a lot of his grand diagonals and avenues were never put into the city as it quickly rebuilt after the fire. As planning came together as an important new practice, discipline, city department, government entity, individuals, city planners, emerged as really powerful forces and shapers of cities. So one of the things that emerged in the 20th century were planning czars, planning dictators in a sense, like Robert Moses here. And I think this photo of Robert Moses is really emblematic because he is larger than life. He is literally larger than the city itself. He's looking down at the bridge and the urban landscape that he is helping to create. So Moses was not an architect, he was not a philosopher, he was a planner and as such had tremendous power to shape the built environment. Inspired by Baron von Haussmann's work in Paris in the 1870s and other competing modernist movements such as Le Corbusier, who again was at the, around the same time period, Robert Moses looked at New York which had passed London by the 1930s to become the largest city in the world. He took out a pen and he drew new modern forms of landscape into the city. Moses was in charge of many different public authorities and he was never elected and therefore had access to huge sums of money in order to implement his infrastructure. Robert Moses put in roads and highways like the Long Island Expressway, the Cross Bronx Expressway, and FDR Drive. You can see here on the left Moses' plan for his road network. Some of these were built and some of these weren't. And this gets into the next part of where I start to talk about the reactions against modernism and a return to a more human-based, small-scale approach to planning, led by activists like Jane Jacobs. So the Cross Manhattan Expressway that would have cut right through Greenwich Village was never built, but much of this was built. Meanwhile, planning was also establishing itself as an academic discipline. The first planning department in the United States 
was at Harvard University in 1923. And so we would now see generations of students studying planning and going on to enter planning in various ways. In the 1920s and 30s, sociologists in Chicago began to coalesce around the urban as its own school of study. Urban sociology was born, and this became known as the Chicago School of Urban Sociology, led by uh, academics like Robert Park and Lewis Wirth. This had been going on for a long time. If you remember uh, people like Charles Booth in, in London or John Snow before that with his cholera map or Jacob Rees, the photographer in New York City, but there had been no coherent school of urban sociology. So people like Park and Wirth built upon earlier traditions to build a school of what it meant to study the city, to look at things like explaining class, explaining neighborhood decline, um, the way that ethnic groups orient themselves in urban space, different forms of urban social organization. And Chicago was a ripe place to do this because it was such a patchwork of neighborhoods, ethnic neighborhoods, both white ethnic neighborhoods and African American and Latinx neighborhoods developing alongside each other. Those in the Chicago school had a laboratory to conduct different forms of ethnography using different methodologies. So mapping was a tool often used to display where ethnic groups uh, work, what type of house uh, people live in, what building types there are, displaying these using different types of visualization. And this would feed into the computer in the late part of the 20th century and become what we now call GIS, or Geographical Information Systems. So we owe a lot of debt to the Chicago School for that. And this new type of thinking about cities wasn't limited to the United States. Walter Benjamin walked the streets of Paris to develop his own type of urban thought. Walking as method, simply walking and taking field notes, observing, remarking, writing about the urban condition and the modern city. In Benjamin's words, it was not to find one's way around the city, that doesn't mean much, but to lose one's way in a city as one loses one's way in a forest. That's hard, that requires some schooling. Street names must speak to the urban wanderer like the snapping of dry twigs, and little streets in the heart of the city must reflect the times of day for him as clearly as a mountain valley. That's what Benjamin wrote in 1934 as part of his never finished Paris Arcades project. 